welcome to So You Want to Be an Energy Specialist. I am Georgia. And I'm Anishba. We're both students at Queen's College London, and today we're talking to Helena and Sam. Helena Scanlon has been with Bar Barninja in the Energy Retail Networks and Waters Business Unit since July 2021. She's worked on a range of projects ranging from water regulation to helping energy suppliers to working with the government to support in the management of the energy crisis. Sam Blanchi is an expert in energy transition with a focus on how technology and IT can both accelerate and realise a future net zero. He has been in consulting for more than 10 years. Welcome Helena and Sam. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, We'll just sort of do a quick introduction ourselves, if you don't mind changing the slides, Sam. So um, as Georgia and Alishba said, I'm Helena and I've been working with Baringa since July 2021. Baringa is a consulting company, so that means it helps by providing expert advice to other companies and supporting them. Um, and I work specifically in the energy retail networks and water business. I didn't know what any of that meant before I started, so don't worry if you don't either. But essentially, I work in energy. Um, and I've done loads of projects. I've helped the government with policies to do with the energy crisis that we're going through at the moment. Um, but I've also um, worked with energy suppliers to help them reach their net zero goals. And if some of those terms don't make any sense to you, hopefully they will by the end of the session. Um, and just um, before I was working in an energy, I was actually a secondary school English teacher. Um, I worked in Brixton teaching English. Um, I'll hand over to Sam to do a brief introduction. Yeah, sure. And and thank you for the introduction earlier as well. So Sam Badamchi, I am somewhat affiliated with uh, Queen's College. My daughter used to be a student there. Um, I've been in consulting for about 10 years. I sit pretty much in the same department that um, Helena sits in. My focus is generally on IT and technology. I've worked with the CIOs of some of the major transition com transmission companies. And generally what I do is I try to help them bring in about technologies that then supports and enables the work that they want to do within energy transition, building new projects, um, serving customers and so forth. Um, I didn't start my career in consulting. I actually started my career in the Middle East. Um, I was at one point an expert in creating artificial fur, but um, that's a totally different story. Life took me into a different direction, and here I am. So very much looking forward to um, having a conversation with you guys and enjoying the presentation that Helena is going to give you. Lovely. Thanks, Sam. So just a quick touch on our aims today. So we're hoping to discuss the kind of changes that are happening in energy today. Um, we're trying to understand what the word net zero that I've already mentioned a couple of times uh, really means. Um, and then most importantly, we're trying to understand what kind of careers and future opportunities that mean there are for you. If you don't mind moving on the slide, Sam. So if we just start from absolute basics, if you think about most of the energy in your home or your schools comes from electricity. So that's how you charge your phones, your hair dryers, your Dyson Air apps, whatever, you're using electricity. Um, and we need different energy resources to generate electricity. And apologies, I'm sure lots of you are aware of this from doing geography or sciences, but just to give a recap. Um, so that could be uh, wind power, um, solar power, fossil fuels, all different types of power that help generate electricity. Um, and these energy resources can be renewable or non-renewable, and they may be terms you're familiar with. Non-renewable means it essentially can be um, quickly replaced um, um, or it can be non-renewable which means it um, cannot be quickly replaced or replenished um, and some of these so fossil fuels is non-renewable and they also produce harmful carbon emissions so non-renewable energy cannot be replaced so essentially in enough time we would run out and then we'd have no way to charge our phones charge our hair dryers um, and on top of that as I said they start producing harmful emissions which ha harm our environment so what do we use in the UK so in the UK we're currently really trying to move away from those non-renewable energies that will run out and move to renewable energy um, so at the moment 47.3% of our electricity comes from renewables, which is good, it's a growing number. Um, so that might be from solar, from wind, we're not gonna run out of sun or wind, so we can keep using those. Um, 
10.3% is nuclear, which isn't renewable, it will run out, but it doesn't produce any harmful carbon emissions, so it's not damaging our environment in the same way. Um, and 21.7 of our electricity still comes from fossil fuels, which, as I've mentioned already, are non-renewable and they produce ca these carbon emissions. Um, so what I, the next slide, we're going to kind of talk about what I mean by those carbon emissions. You may or may not have heard of them. So, Sam, you don't mind moving the slide over. So when I keep talking about these harmful emissions and these carbon emissions that are ruining our environment, I guess what does that actually mean and why does that really matter and again this may be something people are already familiar with and may have heard about or even seen in the news um, so greenhouse gases uh, basically types of gases in our earth's atmosphere that trap heat so more thermal energy is trapped in our atmosphere and that essentially causes the planet to become warmer and warmer than it naturally would have done um, and this is what we're calling global warming so that's having huge social, economic and environmental impacts. And as I said, it may be something we're all pretty aware of already. So how does that relate to what I've spoken about today when we're talking about fossil fuels? I mentioned that fossil fuels create carbon emissions and that's what we're using for our electricity. Carbon, um, carbon dioxide is one of these greenhouse gases. So it's contributing to that effect we talked about global warming. It's make, essentially making the environment get hotter and hotter. And it's actually naturally occurring, carbon dioxide. Um, happens when we breathe, uh, plants produce it, happens during volcanic eruptions. So it does happen naturally, but our behaviour as humans is making it grow much, much quicker than it would have done otherwise, which is increasing that rapid increase in temperature and, and that impact of global warming. So I just so a collection of photos there that I think captures that kind of the impact of that. So we, you may have heard that classic example that uh, the ice caps are melting more because of the increased temperature that we're already seeing, which is ruining animals' habitats. We're seeing more extreme weather events, um, more flooding, which is impacting the poor area, poorest areas in the world. And we're seeing kind of more people get upset about this and protest and go to the streets about this because it's saying that's affecting all of us. So that kind of shows how when we plug things in, when we use electricity, this is the huge overall impact it's having if we don't think carefully about where we're gonna get that electricity from. So that kind of brings us on to this idea of net zero. So net zero is the idea that we want all of those greenhouse gas emissions, the carbon that's being produced to be balanced out. So we need to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas that we are emitting. Um, the idea is that by 2050, we need to limit the temperature that, the, that is increasing in the world, the global warming effect. We need to limit that to 1.5 degrees to avoid the worst social, economic and environmental impacts. So I think this nicely shows that if we don't take any action, the global surface temperatures are going to rise by to four degrees as early as 2060. Although that may not sound like a massive number, that's gonna have absolutely huge impacts, um, making some places nearly unlivable. It'll just be too hot. It's gonna ruin agriculture, how we grow food, um, animal habitats It's gonna have massive impacts if we don't take any action. The current policy at, that we have at the moment, if we didn't do anything at all, would mean that it would still keep us just below two degrees, which would still be pretty high. Um, and then this Paris Agreement goal is to keep it at 1.5. And that is what net zero is aiming to do, is aiming to minimize our greenhouse gas emissions so that we can limit that warming effect to 1.5 degrees. So it's, that may, it's not all doom and gloom, because that's where kind of the exciting opportunities come out of this, is that there is so much brilliant work already being done and continuing to grow to sort of help us start to reach our goals for net zero to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So just to give you an idea of the kind of work you can do, and this is work that we do a lot of in Beringa as consultants, because we go to these other companies and offer support. Um, you could work with industry. So we do lots of work um, to support energy suppliers. And so those are the companies that supply us with our energy, our electricity, and help them think about their choices of where they're getting that from and help them start to pick more renewable energy sources that don't produce carbon emissions. 
uh, there are opportunities in insulating homes. There's loads of work being done about how we can insulate our homes so we don't spend as much money and electricity trying to heat the houses so that we can minimise the, the, um, how much we're using to reduce carbon emissions. There's also lots of work in policy and government. Um, so government really needs help and support in defining and creating policies to help people and businesses and whole sectors achieve this goal of um, producing less carbon. So giving them the rules and ideas of how they can do that. Um, electoral ve vehicles, which is a really exciting um, time for these. It's There's a lot of work um, being done to help companies who essentially want to start selling electric vehicles. Um, and there's lots of opportunities in terms of uh, people who want to set up charging stations, so charging people to use, almost like charge their cars. Um, and there's lots of jobs in that. Um, and there's also, I know that here at Baringa, there was some exciting work helping races like Formula One, how they can make sure that they're being more environmentally friendly and that they're producing less carbon emissions. So I know people who worked on that, which was really exciting. And then finally, you can work with businesses. So lots of businesses really want to start being conscious of this and um, start making more sustainable choices and helping, helping them also reduce their carbon emissions is quite an exciting role. So there are all sorts of jobs, and this really only just covers a few of them that are coming out of the back of this. And although it there are sort of scary elements to it and it's it's a really exciting time because we're seeing a lot of really positive change that's just going to continue to grow. So I think I'll move us on to any questions people have from that. Um, we haven't got any questions on the chat so far, but I think Alicia has a question for you. Um, so firstly, thank you both. It was really interesting to hear about the changes that are happening in like the energy sector um, and what net zero actually means, um, as well as like zooming into possible career opportunities. But we wanted to ask, how realistic do you think the Paris Agreement actually is in aiming for a 1.5 degree rise up until 2050? Yeah, I suppose it's a really interesting question. And I think it's probably quite, subjective and everyone has very different opinions of this. Um, I'm ever ever the optimist um, and think um, if not if not reach that if not hit that goal at least near about it. Um, and I think it's yeah I suppose also it's important to think about whether we're talking about UK or world um, because I think beyond the UK perhaps less achievable I think there's lots of positive work that's being done that means we could get quite close to it here um Sam I don't know if you had any further thoughts on that no I concur with you I think I think you said it really well um it's current trajectories aren't unfortunately that we're going to hit the target uh, but that doesn't mean that technology and other means to accelerate it um and increase the magnitude isn't going to come online um, and I think the second element is what Helena said a minute ago. Um, we should look at a global perspective on this. Um, a lot of the times we probably just look at it from a UK perspective. That wouldn't be the right thing to do. I think it's a global matter. Um, if other areas in the world suffer as a result, inevitably we will suffer too. Um, so I think it was a good answer, Helena. And our next question is from Rahima. How much do you expect the percentages of carbon emissions to decrease in the future? Yeah, um, I think that I think it kind of touches on what what we were saying now. It's in that, um, as Sam said, we're not bang on target in our reductions of carbon emissions and reduction of, of greenhouse gases generally. I think it's key to note here that carbon is not the only emission. It's just kind of one that's quite central to the work we do in terms of energy transition. Um, but there are also other man-made gases that. Uh, contributing to the problem so um, in terms of carbon I think that kind of relates directly to what we were saying and that we are leading in terms of um, trying to bring more renewables in and it kind of depends on as Sam said the policy but I think also it's important to take a step back and see that you know the problem goes quite wide and there are lots of changes we're going to have to make but I think in this area we are kind of constantly innovating and making progress. Uh, I think there are, I think we can be optimistic, um, although we have to be somewhat realistic as well. I think we can be optimistic. The 
there are a couple of things that are, are significant in our stride. So I think the world is going to hopefully electrify and therefore neutralize the effects of transport. So I'm talking about road transport. Um, I think um, airplanes and aerospace is going to be a question for the future. Uh, potentially, we are not going to make um, neutral or, or renewable fueled airplanes anytime soon or electrical airplanes anytime soon. Um, it's more likely that we will change the behavior of transport. I think some big um, contributors to greenhouse like cement production, steel production, those things are going to become net zero, uh, hopefully by about 2030, if not past that point is slightly. Um, there's, there's good thinking that that's a possibility. So are we going to be Depending on track for our 2050 targets, potentially not. Um, are we going to be able to innovate technology that then sees the effects of those implications mitigated? Potentially, yes. So I think it's there's room to um, stay optimistic. Um, I wanted to ask, um, like, what policies have you helped to make with the government that you think are like your best, most like reachable ones? Yeah, it's, it's also a really good question. I think the nature of working as a consultant means you kind of go in and you help for a little bit. So sometimes I don't even see the whole impact of what I've been doing reach through to the end. And I, just, you know, I think also the nature of government is sometimes you work really hard on a policy and then it's, they're not able to go through with it or it doesn't work. And that's sort of just part of the, the risk and excitement of it, I suppose. I think what I worked on recently was probably the most favorite bit of work I've done in government um, and that that was that piece which was helping businesses um, and I was for a long time kind of working on the communication side so I was speaking with people who run businesses and they were emailing and talking about um, their kind of yeah their their problems and issues they're facing and I kind of liked interacting with them directly and thinking about solutions for that so that's definitely my favorite but we're currently, as Berinda, we're currently helping the industry uh, define new markets in which you sell electricity or sell services um, to the electricity value chain. So sometimes it happens that because we're working on renewables, there isn't enough sun, there isn't enough wind. Um, how do you bring on some other means of technology that generates electricity and balances the demand and supply of electricity within the UK? Um, these require new markets. They need, require new ways of interacting suppliers and, and buyers. It requires new way of reporting, new way of controlling. Um, those are some of the methods and approaches that we That's define. Awesome. Um, and then we help the interested companies implement the technologies associated with it. Um, okay. So that's uh, yeah, that's one of the things we've done. Um, I mean, C says that people keep saying that we will be doing jobs that don't even exist yet. What future areas are looking exciting right now? So I just unmute myself. I think it's it's um, touching on what Sam was saying before. The technologies um, and things that we have are kind of working on now of different ways we can produce um, renewable energy. And I think we don't even know what that landscape will look like in a few years. And there'll be so many jobs within that. Um, and it's the same with if you think about electric vehicles how popular they're becoming, how much they're, how much more they're entering the market. Like I mentioned that work with uh, Formula One um, and that's really, you know, th those kind of roles are really exciting as more and more businesses are looking to advance and develop the way they work to become more sustainable and more technologies are being designed and brought to the market that you can work on. So I think it's a really innovative space at the moment. Um, and there's so much being brought to the table. So I think it's really exciting from that perspective. Um, we also have some questions coming in from other students. So thank you to Kanari from Kinsdale School, um, who has asked, what is the most exciting project Beringa has worked on? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And there's so, uh, I was speaking with my um, colleagues about this before I did this because I'm worried mine don't sound exciting enough. Um, I mentioned that um, job on Formula One that I was quite jealous of. I thought that sounded really cool, helping them become more sustainable. Um, the same person also got to work with Arsenal, the football club, um, because they were worried about power cuts and they wanted a battery installed in their um, stadiums. Um, 
I mean, for me, what I find exciting is I've done a lot of work, you know, um, just help, you know, like I mentioned, that kind of net zero goal, helping businesses achieve that and working within government. So it really depends on what you find exciting. I think the Arsenal and Formula, Formula One probably sounds more exciting to most. Um, there's really a whole range of topics and it just shows the range of projects you can work on in this area. Um, there's so much I haven't even looked into or, you know, so, so much more I can learn as well. Um, but I think that's what makes this kind of career really exciting. Is there's so many different things. Um, we've also got some more questions that are coming through. So thank you to Lara Brooks from Jags, who has asked, how long do you think it will take for the UK to completely get rid of fossil fuel sources? How likely do you think this is? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question, um, one I don't have an answer to. I think we were speaking when, when we did the session before about um, where we are in the UK just generally in terms of our um, of how much more sustainable we're becoming and how close we are to reaching our net zero goals. And I've said I'm, I'm quite optimistic about it. I, you know, I think um, there's so many more innovations and things being brought to the market that could really help us achieve our goals. Um, in terms of reducing those emissions. Um, in terms of fossil fuel reliance, I'm not too sure the feasibility of that. I don't know, Sam, is that something you've come across more? Well, I, I think uh, I think it depends on who you are and where you're sitting. Um, you, so you're right. Uh, we, we have a target that by 2030, we would um, achieve net zero uh, within the UK. Um, there are certain constraints and dependencies for that target to be met. I think the current projections aren't, we're not necessarily bang on the plan with that. But having said that, we are making significant strides. I think it's a matter of how quickly policy um, can change uh, in order to facilitate that uh, moving forward. So for example, we need to connect more renewable generation into the grid, into the network. Uh, planning constraints or planning policies are a bit of a constraint to that effect. How quickly can we change those in order to accelerate it is, is a question. Um, but I think it's suffice to say that UK uh, is a global leader in this in this um, in this race. Um, and I think we're overall doing pretty well. As a, as a consultant, what steps have you taken to improve global warming? Yeah, um, great question. I think that's kind of what we've been trying to uh, think about with this presentation is how um, as a consultant or as somebody who you know decides to take a career in the energy sector you can kind of have a direct impact on this net zero and on this not necessarily reducing the warming but stopping the stopping the warming and limiting it um as we mentioned um so i think for me it's there's been quite um i've had a lot of touch points in my different projects with this um one example is i worked with a um an energy supplier on their business plan and that was really exciting because they got to see how many changes they're trying to make and working with the government to make to ensure that they are reaching net zero and to make sure that they are hitting those targets and um, they had to get it all approved by the government so the government helped them reach that goal and I worked directly on that so um, it's fun it's kind of nice to get an opportunity to work directly with a supplier and kind of get stuck directly in with the people who can make a difference, i.e. the energy suppliers, starting to make that transition and working with them to transition um, has been, yeah, that's kind of one example of how you can work directly and have a, a direct impact. There's a question that I see in the chat box which says, what qualifications do people need? Do you need a science A-level? Definitely not. Um, I'm just speaking with someone who is very mathematically challenged and wasn't very good at sciences. I dropped biology at AS. Don't know if they have ASs anymore. Um, but I did um, a degree in theology, so like religion, and then I was an English teacher. So I've got no science background. And I think it just shows a, like a company like Beringa, it depends how you want to go into it. I've met people who work um, in energy from government who didn't go to university at all, who work their way up in government, um, which is really exciting. Or I've met um, people who've come from industry, so they've worked with an energy supplier and then come over here. Or you have people like me who have absolutely no background or history at all in energy or sciences, who are kind of learning this all anew and it's just, it's exciting for that reason because it's all new to me. 
and Helena is one of our very um, successful consultants. So just just to add to the sentiment that that you don't need science and you can be very successful in this line of business. Um, I think just to supplement what what Helena said, um, consulting is a lot about curiosity. Um, is is a lot about um, being able to adapt to a variety of different work and problem statements. Um, it requires a huge amount of sort of um, teamwork um, and, and, and good interactions with our customers. Um, I think that probably is a slight distinguishment between what we do and what others might do in terms of a, 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 a fixed role within, within the industry. Um, so the question is, what industries or jobs are you thinking of? Any advice from Sam and Helena that you're thinking of? Um, so I'm currently taking geography A-level with economics and politics. So I've been, like recently, we've been doing like UCAS research and things like that. So I've been looking into studying geography um, in university. Um, I like... Uh, one of my geography teachers mentioned that there's like a whole range of things that you can go into with geography. So I was looking into like working for like like investment banks to do with like um, you know like financial risk and things like that, and how like sustainability plays a big role in that. Um, so that's something that interests me quite a lot. What about you, Georgia? Um, I'm looking into going into biological sciences or possibly veterinary science and then because I'm really interested in like endangered, endangered animals right now and I guess that's like a lot to do with like sustainability because uh, a lot of the reason like um, populations of like animals are decreasing is because of global warming um, but I, I haven't I'm not sure about what I mean I could go into consulting but do you did you have a like straight a kind of a clear path to like where you are now I guess is my question yeah I I mean I absolutely didn't um I have yeah I've sort of gone here there all over the place kind of working out what um what excites me and I think um yeah it's, it's like you say with the, having a real interest in sustainability because you care about um animals and I think that's a very valid passion um it's sort of it's finding a job that doesn't necessarily always mean you're kind of there, you know, giving, getting, picking up the polar bears yourself and taking them somewhere safe. It's more working behind the scenes on policies and working behind the scenes um, on things like net zero that you know are going to have a direct impact in that way. And that's what I think gives you a lot of satisfaction. And no, that doesn't mean you definitely have to go, you know, through the consulting route. It's just, it becomes quite a nice option and a way to explore different kind of projects and roles that kind of give you that sense of feeling like you're, you know, you're working towards something you're passionate about. Um, I think actually, I, I really don't know much about the kind of financial space and financial risk and that sustainability angle on that, but it's definitely something that is massively growing. I think in Baringa, we've just um, uh, starting a, a sustainability business unit because there was so much crossover between people working in finance and people kind of having an interest in sustainability that they've actually now made it its own business area so it's definitely something that's growing um, just to, to touching on what you were saying Elisha so yeah it's a really exciting like career space and it's definitely something that's growing at the moment. Uh, I didn't start my career in consulting I, in fact I started in something absolutely unrelated to it um, kind of fight, you know, life, fate took me to it. Um, so you can always, you know, when you have transferable skills, you can come into it. Um, just to build on something that you guys said a minute ago, Alicia, in, in, in Georgia. So if you're interested in investment banking, doesn't mean that you won't find your way somehow over sustainability and environment. Um, right now, a lot of investment bankers and asset management companies want to ascertain the risk that their assets carry in relation to environment. So if you have a lot of real estate in Florida, just because of global warming, all of that real estate could be at risk. What does that mean in terms of your returns and your futures and so forth? So investment banks look at that. We have, for example, offerings to support that, that dilemma. From Georgia, from a, uh, a biology perspective, a humongous amount of greenhouse effects comes from methane. Methane is a significant product of um, cows within agriculture. 
there's a lot of biological study being done around what can you do through vaccines or otherwise in order to reduce that method. So we right now live in a world where climate and energy is a significant topic for human, you know, humanity's future. And everything that you look at around you, some way or another, it has a link to that topic. So I wouldn't say if you're interested in um, energy and you, you have sustainability as a passion, you necessarily need to come into consulting. That's just one venue. Um, you would find yourself anywhere else within the world, some way or another, looking at a topic of how you can actually help the environment in the future. Um, I've just got a question that would probably help quite a lot of our students and maybe others. For students interested in working in the energy sector later on, um, what kind of work experience would you recommend that they start to take on now? And um, we have a number of students who in year 12 will be doing work experience throughout the year, or they may be doing a week in the summer or something similar. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. I think um, I'm worried about kind of giving too much of a consultant leaning um, kind of answer because I don't truthfully know what opportunities there are directly with um, energy suppliers um, but lots of consulting um, companies look at energy um, and lots of them including um, Baringa often offer work placements and internships so um, doing something like that and again not to push the consulting agenda but it means that you kind of have an opportunity to work um, within energy in a consultancy um, and kind of get to ask people like myself and work with them who have worked on lots of different energy projects and have quite a broad idea of the kind of projects and work and so that might be quite a good way to get exposed to those types of projects. Um, I also think there's probably lots of uh, charities um, that work in sustainability so if it's more broadly just an area you're interested in I'm sure there are lots of opportunities for volunteering or um, yeah, getting involved in some sort of work placements with charities that look at sustainability. Um, I don't know, Sam, if you've heard of any other kind of uh, work placement or internship opportunities within energy? No, not, not necessarily for those who are intending to be doing some work at year, like year two, 12. Um, I, would, I would suggest that when you enter the job market, irrespective of what it's going to be, um, you want to be able to tell us stories around teamwork, about flexibility, about discipline, about problem solving, almost any of the jobs out there um, can do that, even if you end up working in, in, in you know, retail, as an example. Um, I, would, I would suggest do something, doesn't necessarily have to be and always be um, in a related subject. Um, what I would recommend though, that if you are passionate about energy, if you are passionate about um, consulting, um, do a bit of reading on the topic. Uh, there are a lot of literature out there that is very up to date. It's very relevant. Um, even if you do a simple search on Google around energy transition, where we are in the UK, they are all represented in simple, meaningful language. Um, there are YouTube channels out there or podcasts that um, that are relevant. The more informed you are. Um, about that topic, the stories that you would tell ultimately when you're going in front of an interviewer, it becomes much more impactful. Yeah, I think it kind of links what we were saying earlier. I've had a very not typical, um, not typical journey to become a consultant and working with energy. But when I was a teacher, um, the kind of skills and the people skills that I grew there from working with students like yourselves and um, all of the skills I took from that when I came and applied here they were able to recognize the, how that is valuable and it's not at all related to energy so I think Sam's exactly right work on building your skills and work on building an interest in whatever field you want to go into sustainability energy and when you start looking at jobs and looking at internships they'll be able to see you both have interest and skill even if you haven't done direct work experience with a supplier for example. Thank you so much for your advice. Um, and I think that was our last question for today. Um, so thank you so much, Helena and Sam, for taking the time to speak to us today and for answering all of our questions. Um, to the audience, thank you for coming and for asking really insightful, intelligent, helpful questions too. Uh, we hope you will join us um, soon again and goodbye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.